hopes of gaining an advantage over the enemy during the First World War, opposing sides began using aircraft in more offensive roles, such as attacking enemy ground targets. These early bombers were not much to speak of, as the crew had to drop the bombs by hand. Over the following decade, the effectiveness of these aircraft was constantly improved, but their precision was still lacking. The Germans approached this problem by using a more precise method, the dive bombing attack. For this reason, in the 1930s, they initiated a series of different dive bomber proposals, with the Junkers Ju-87 being chosen as the winner. The Ju-87 would become one of the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War, feared for its precise strikes, but also for its unique use of sirens for psychological warfare. After the First World War, the Germans began experimenting with ideas on how to make aircraft more precise during ground attack operations. Conventional bombers, which dropped their payload in straight and level flight, could effectively engage larger targets like urban centers, industrial facilities, and infrastructure. However, this method was less effective for destroying smaller targets like bunkers or bridges. A dive attack, on the other hand, provided a greater chance of hitting smaller targets. This concept of dive attack aircraft would be studied and tested in detail by the Germans during the 1930s and was referred to as Stutzkampfbomber, or dive bomber. The development of such aircraft was greatly hindered by the prohibitions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. To overcome this, some German companies simply opened up smaller subsidiaries in other countries. In the case of the Junkers, a subsidiary company known as Flegindustrie operated in Sweden. There, they developed the K-47 two-seater fighter in 1929. It was tested for the role of dive bombing and proved successful, but its price was too high for the German Luftwaffe, so it was rejected. As a stopgap, the Germans adopted the Heinkel HE-50 in 1932. The following year, a more comprehensive test of the dive bombing concept was undertaken using a Ju-52 bomber. Overall results were disappointing, thus the development of a completely new dedicated design was prioritized. For this, Luftwaffe officials asked all domestic aircraft manufacturers to present their models for the dive bomber competition. Junkers began working on their next dive bomber project in 1933, under the guidance of engineer Hermann Pohlmann. He stressed the importance of an overall robust aircraft design that would be able to withstand steep diving maneuvers. Additionally, it had to have fixed landing gear and all-metal construction. The next year, a fully completed wooden mock-up with inverted gull wings and twin tail fins was built. Officials from the Reichsluftfahrtsministerium, or German Aviation Ministry, inspected the mock-up in late 1934, but they were not impressed and didn't place a production order. Despite this, Junkers continued working on the project, building a working Ju-87 V1 prototype. Powered by a 640 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine, its first test flight was completed in September of 1935. While the first flight was generally successful, the use of a foreign engine was deemed unsatisfactory and it was requested that a domestically built engine be used instead. This aircraft would be lost in an accident when one of the twin tail fins broke off during a dive test near Dresden. Both the pilot and the passenger lost their lives. The examination of the wreckage showed that the fin design was too weak and had to be replaced with a simple conventional tail fin. The next prototype, V2, was built with a 610 horsepower Yumo 210A engine and had a redesigned tail fin. Another addition was the installation of special slats that could be rotated 90 degrees forward perpendicular to the underside of the wing, acting as dive brakes. V2 also received a specially designed bomb release mechanism meant to avoid accidentally hitting the radiator and propeller. When the pilot activated the bomb release during a dive, the specially designed cradle would swing forward and down and eject the bomb. In essence, this catapulted the bomb safely away from the plane while still maintaining its trajectory towards the target. There were a number of delays with the redesign of the airframe, which led to V-2's first flight being made in late February 1936. While the test flight was successful, Luftwaffe officials showed some reluctance with regard to the project, given the fate of the first prototype. Nevertheless, the Ju-87, together with the Heinkel HE-118, Blomontvoss HA-137, and Arado AR-81, were used in a dive bomber competition. The initial results favored the Heinkel but the HE-118 was lost during one of its test flights. In the end, the RLM proclaimed the Ju-87 as the winner. Following this competition, Junkers built a few more prototypes in order to improve the overall performance of the Ju-87. These received a number of modifications, like an enlarged tail fin, added counterweights on the elevators, 
a modified landing gear, and a redesigned engine cowl to improve forward visibility. Most importantly, the V4 prototype was the first to receive offensive armament. During the test trials, these planes achieved a maximum cruising speed of about 155 miles per hour, or 250 kilometers per hour. The RLM would become increasingly concerned about the JU-87 design, as this cruising speed was the same of the older HE-50. Despite this, the handling and resilience of the whole airframe were deemed satisfactory, so the whole project went on. Following the success of the prototype series, the RLM officials issued orders for more JU-87 aircraft. This would lead to a small production run of the JU-87A0 pre-production model. Further development led to the JU-87A1, which was powered by the UMO 210D engine. The A1 series was able to carry one 250kg bomb in its standard two-man crew configuration. Alternatively, it could carry one 500kg bomb out. In this case, the rear machine gunner had to be left behind. The latest version of the series was the JU-87A2. It was slightly improved by adding better radio equipment, increased engine performance, a new two-stage compressor, and a new propeller. JU-87A production began in the spring of 36 and ended in the summer of 38. By that time, Junkers built between 262 and 400 JU-87 of the A series. The JU-87 was quite notorious for its sharp dive attack. The pilot would commence the dive bombing run once the target was identified. The target would be located through a hatch that was placed on the cockpit floor, and would usually be carried out from an altitude of less than 2,000 meters, or a little over a mile. The aircraft would then be rolled around by the pilot until it was upside down. Another favored method was simply diving forward, as it was simpler to pull out. The JU-87 would then engage its target at an angle of attack of about 45 to 85 degrees with a speed of 500 to 600 kilometers per hour. During these dive bombing runs, there was a chance the pilot would temporarily lose consciousness due to G-force. If the pilot was unable to pull up, a ground collision was a strong possibility. To avoid this, the JU-87 was equipped with automatic dive brakes that would simply level out the plane at a safe altitude. Once the plane reached a level flight, the brakes would then disengage. The JU-87 was also equipped with warning lights that informed the pilot when it was time to release the bomb. The JU-87A series was not equipped with the infamous sirens used on later models. The Germans conducted extensive research to determine how much G-force a pilot could endure without any medical problems. The testing revealed that the pilot could overcome a 4G force without any problems, and at 5Gs, the pilot would experience blurred vision. The maximum G-forces were noted to be 8.5G, but only for 3 seconds. Anything more, and you get extensive injuries or death. The Ju-87 saw its first combat action during the Spanish Civil War, as the Germans saw this war as the perfect place to test their new aircraft designs. For this reason, the V-4 prototype was secretly disassembled and transported on a passenger ship to Spain in August 1936. It was part of the experimental unit Versus Commando VK-88 of the Condor Legion. The overall performance or even use of the aircraft is generally unknown. It may have taken part of the Battle of Bilbao in June of 1937, after which it was shipped back to Germany. In early 1938, three more aircraft of the A-1 series were shipped to Spain. These were given to the first Staffel of Stützkampfgeschwader 162 dive bomber wing. Their initial base of operations were on the airfield near Saragossa, Spain. There were some problems with the forward landing gear covers which would dig into the ground on the sandy soil of the airfield. To resolve this issue, the crews simply got rid of them. The use of larger 500kg bombs required the removal of the rear gunner, so the smaller 250kg bomb load was more frequently used. In March of 1938, the three JU-87s attempted to attack retreating Spanish Republican units in Arajón. The attacks were less than successful due to a lack of experience of the pilots. From July of 1938 on, the JU-87 showed a more promising performance during the failed Spanish Republican counterattack at the Ebro River and Mequinenza. By October, all three JU-87As were shipped back to Germany. The overall performance of the A-series was deemed insufficient for combat operations early on. This, together with the fact that the improved JU-87B version was becoming available in increasing numbers, led to a quick withdrawal of the A-versions from service. These would be reallocated to training units and would be used in this role up to 1944. 
Despite being quickly removed from service, some of the Ju-87As found themselves in service with the Hungarians, as they also received a contingent of the later version Ju-87Bs, at least four Ju-87As were also supplied to be used for crew training. This concludes our look at the early development of the Ju-87A. What do you think about the first series of the Ju-87? Was it a good design, or should the contract have gone to one of its competitors? Let us know in the comments. If you like what we do and want to see more, remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on a single video. Also, don't forget to take a look at our extensive collection of articles on our website, plain-encyclopedia.com. Thank you.